بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith up to this point in time we've been discussing the first part of our shahada or لا إله إلا الله and we went into a lot of detail regarding the meaning of Tawheed the types of Tawheed some of the factors that go against Tawheed before we conclude it is important to talk about the second part of our testimony as well, Muhammadur Rasulullah. So for the next few episodes, we're going to be discussing the implications of this testimony of faith. Stay with us. Our topic for today and for the next episodes will be the rights of the Prophet ﷺ over us. Or if you like, you can say the implications of Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Before we jump into the rights though We need to know who we're talking about A small short biography of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Was the son of Abdullah The son of Abdul Muttalib The son of Hisham The son of Abd Manaf The son of Qusay The son of Kilab The son of Murra Of the descendants of Adnan who was of the descendants of Ismail, the son of the Prophet Ibrahim, and Ibrahim salam was of the descendants of the Prophet Nuh, who was of the descendants of our father Adam salam. And our Prophet's lineage sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is well known for 20 or 30 generations before him, and it is a lineage of very noble Arabs. All of his ancestors were very noble and very famous. And in fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he is the one who has the greatest lineage or the one who has the most noble ancestors. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was born in, it is known as the year of the elephant. By Western standards, it's 570, 571 uh, CE. And this was the year where the king of Abyssinia wished to attack Mecca and the story is well known. He was born after his father's death. His father died before he was born. And when he was only six years old, his mother Amina as well died. And then he was entrusted to the care of his uncle, his grandfather, uh, Abdul Muttalib. And then when he was eight years old, even his grandfather died. And it was his uncle, Abu Talib, his father's brother, who raised him up until, he, until even Abu Talib passed away. Uh, the Prophet wasallam married at the age of 25. And he lived a chaste life before that. And even after his marriage and before his marriage, he never did any sin. He, he would avoid worshipping the idols even though all of his society was worshipping idols. He would avoid eating the meat that was sacrificed in the name of the idols. He would avoid participating in the ceremonies of the pagans. Why? Because he was upon the fitrah or the proper pure nature which we discussed in previous episodes. He was upon the pure fitrah or the pure uh, nature that Allah had guided him to even though he was not a prophet at this time in other words, inspiration had not yet started, revelation had not yet started, yet he did not commit any major sin. When he was 40 years old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him with Iqra. And this was in the famous cave of Hira. Because the Prophet ﷺ would leave his society for periods of time. He would leave the culture and the city and he would go and contemplate and sit Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever way he knew. He did not know the five prayers yet. But he knew that Allah was worthy of worship. So he would worship him in that cave. And while he was sitting there, the angel Jibreel came to him and started the process of the revelation of the Qur'an. So for the next 13 years, in the face of severe hardship, torture, adversity, the Prophet wasallam preached La ilaha illallah. No commandments were revealed except for some basic commandments of the salah. But no other commandments, not even the details of salah. The details of salah came towards the end of these 13 years. No prayer, no charity, no fasting, no pilgrimage, no jihad, nothing. Except for la ilaha illallah. All he's doing is he's preaching tawheed. He's calling the people to leave their false idols and to worship the creator of them and their idols as well. And his followers were persecuted. He himself was persecuted as well. Many of them were killed just because of this call. Especially those who were weak and oppressed of the society. Many of them were tortured to death. Such as Yasir and his wife Sumayya. Such as Bilal, he was almost tortured to death. 
the famous Abyssinian slave. Just because of this call, they were not calling for a revolution of political society. They were not calling for uh, implementation of zakah or the economic system. No, they were only calling for a revolution of the soul. That people not worship created objects, but rather turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for worship. So for 13 years, he called to this call until in this last year when he was in Mecca, his beloved wife Khadija passed away and also his beloved uncle Abu Talib. And this was a great loss to him because these were the two most beloved people to him. And Khadija was of course the first Muslim who accepted his call. Abu Talib unfortunately did not accept Islam and he died in the religion of his forefathers. But the Prophet ﷺ loved him as his uncle and the one who took care of him. So the loss of these two people was a very big loss to the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, in order to console him, Allah Azza wa Jal took him on a miraculous night journey, which we call it Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Al Isra means that he went at night from Mecca to Jerusalem. This is Al Isra. Al Mi'raj means he went up from Jerusalem to Allah Azza wa Jal. So on this night, the Prophet ﷺ, in body and in soul, Allah took him and transported him to Jerusalem. And there he led all of the other 124,000 prophets in prayer to show you the superiority and the status of this Prophet of ours, Muhammad ﷺ, that he is their Imam, he is their leader. He is the leader of all the prophets. And to prove this point, he led them all in prayer. All of the prophets ever sent, 124,000 we know in one narration. And after this, he went up to Allah Azza wa Jal, and he went to a place with Jibreel, and then Jibreel said, I cannot go further. I am not allowed to go further, it is you alone who must go. So he went to a place where even the angel Jibreel could not go. And he spoke to Allah Azza wa Jal directly, without the medium of Jibreel, without there being an interpreter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him at this time that he has to pray five times a day. And he, uh, and he legislated the salah in this auspicious occasion. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went, came back to earth, the mushrikun or the pagans did not believe him. They ridiculed him. But Abu Bakr, his famous companion, he believed the story. And he said, if Muhammad said it, it must be true, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, he, called, he was called as siddiq or the one who believes and that very year, Allah commanded the Prophet ﷺ to immigrate to another city. Because the people of that city had for the last two, three years slowly been coming to Mecca and accepting Islam. First only 13, then 70. Then the Prophet ﷺ found out that most of the city or much of the city was Muslim. And then they invited him to come. So Allah Azza wa Jal inspired him to leave Mecca and to go to a city by the name of Yathrib, which he renamed Medina. Medina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In our times it is known as Medina. In those times it was called Yathrib. So he went to this city, he immigrated, he performed the hijrah, and this marks the beginning of our Islamic calendar. Zero hijrah. This auspicious, monumentous journey where he left his own people. He left his own city which he loved more than any other city in the world because he could not worship Allah and his followers could not worship Allah the way that they should worship him. So they left to the city of Medina. And that is where all of the other rulings and commandments came down. The specifics of how to pray, how to give zakah, of, of, of fasting the month of Ramadan, of going for the pilgrimage, the economic system, the social system, the family system, marriage and divorce, all of the laws were revealed in Medina. And in this time where he lived another 10 years in Medina, there were a number of skirmishes, battles between him and the Mushrikun and the Quraysh of Mecca. Of them is the famous battle of Badr in the two or the second year of the Hijrah. Of them is the battle of Uhud in the third year of the Hijrah. Of them is the battle of Ahzab in the fifth year. And the battle of Badr and Uhud, they both occurred outside of Medina. Uh, Uhud right outside of Medina and Badr a bit further down. But the battle of Ahzab, the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Medina and the people came to uh, attack him. And he was in the city, so they had to build a trench around the city as a means of protecting them. And after this, the, until finally in the eighth year of the Hijrah, eight years after he left Mecca, he finally returned as a conqueror to Mecca. He finally came back having conquered the entire city without shedding any blood. And when the people came, those same people that had persecuted him, tortured him, killed some of his followers, those same people that refused to allow him to worship Allah alone and call to that worship, when they came to him, 
He asked them, what do you think I'm going to do to you? They were scared, trembling, because he has the right, as many of the people before him and after him, the many of the conquerors would do, to kill such type of people. The conqueror, he comes and he kills the people that opposed him. So when he asked him, what do you think I'm going to do to you? They were coward, trembling, scared. They said, you are our brother and the son of our brother. You are our relative. They're begging for mercy. So the Prophet ﷺ said, go, for you are free. I will not harm you today. And because of this one act, most if not all of the people embraced Islam when they saw his generosity. In the 10th year of the Hijrah, he went to perform the pilgrimage, the farewell pilgrimage, where over a hundred thousand companions came with him and heard his final speech. His final speech which he gave to so many people. Of course, he gave some speeches after this, but the final speech which he gave to a large gathering of a hundred thousand people. And of the, of the famous statements that he said in this speech was that there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, of a white over a black. No, all of you are the children of Adam and the best of you is the one who has the most iman, the most faith, the one who is the most pious. Having completed his message, having fulfilled the reason why Allah sent him, which was to spread La ilaha illallah, shortly thereafter, his message came to him from his Lord. On the 12th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal, in the 11th year of the Hijrah, the angel of death came to take his soul. And it was the greatest loss to the companions and to the Muslim Ummah. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq stood up at that auspicious time, that time when the Muslims were trembling of what to do. They didn't know what was the next step. How would they live? How would they survive? And he made his famous statement. And he said, Verily, whoever used to worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then know that Muhammad is now dead. But whoever used to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah is al Hay, the ever-living, who never dies. And then he recited the verse that Muhammad sallallahu is only a messenger. Many are the messengers that have come before him. If he dies or is killed, are you going to turn back on your tracks? This was the message of Allah. This was the messenger of Allah. And this is a short biography. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back continuing in the testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah and what it means for us. Stay tuned. <laughs> Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, for those who want to enter the Jannah, the paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for the believers. And that's why we need to learn and we need to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that we submit ourselves to the orders of Allah. This is knowledge that we need to learn. That's why we're spending more time to look into the verses and to the meanings of the verses in depth so that we can get to learn from it what we need ourselves to be steadfast, to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ponder over the meanings of the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Welcome back. This Prophet of Allah, the greatest Prophet ever to have been sent, was given many, many blessings and many, many miracles. Of the blessings that he was given and of the miracles that he was given was that the pagans came to him and said, show us a sign. So he asked them, what do you want to see? They said, show us this moon that is a full moon. Show us that the moon has been split apart if you are truly sent by Allah. So he made a dua. And Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the moon to be split in half so that they could see one half of it on one side of the mountain and the other half on the other side. Of the miracles that he was given was that the people around him could hear the rocks and the stones in his hand praising Allah, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. They could hear it from themselves. Of the miracles that he was given on many occasions was that a small amount of food sufficed for hundreds if not thousands of people. In fact, on one occasion, when the people of Medina, this was during the Battle of Ahzab, they don't have anything to eat. One companion sees the Prophet ﷺ not having eaten and not having drank. 
for a long time. So he goes to his wife and he says, what do we have? We only have some milk. So he said to the Prophet, we have some milk to give you. But it was only for him. So he went privately to tell him. What does the Prophet do? He says, call all of the companions. All of them came to this man's house and he only had one glass of milk. And he allowed every single companion to drink to his fill from this one glass. And there were over a hundred people. They kept on drinking, drinking, drinking until finally the Prophet ﷺ was the last one to drink and there was still milk left over in the glass. And this happened on many times. Clear and open miracle. Of the miracles that he was given was that once he would stand on a date on, a, on the trunk of a date palm tree to give his talks. So once he said, why don't one of you build a platform, a mimbar, a pulpit for me? Let me stand on this pulpit. So he stood on the pulpit and he left the date palm. The companion said, we could hear this date palm crying like a baby cries because the Prophet ﷺ had left him. And he had started, and he went to the, date, to the pulpit. So we saw the Prophet ﷺ come down and hug the date palm until it stopped crying. Then it was cut and it was dug beneath the pulpit. Such that to this day, in the Prophet's masjid, underneath the pulpit, that same date palm is there. The, the, the companions heard this with their own two ears. And many are the miracles that he has been given. Really, we can talk hours and hours about the number of miracles. They don't number in the hundreds, they number in the thousands. But his greatest miracle was the miracle of the Qur'an. It is the greatest miracle because... It is the one miracle which is free of the barriers of time and space. This is the one miracle that you don't have to have been there at that time and at that place to have seen. No, it is still here for us to see it. This is the greatest miracle that any of the prophets have ever been given. Because all of the other prophets, their miracles are at a certain time at a certain place. You either see it or you don't and you must hear about it. But the miracle of the Qur'an at all times and at all places, you can be in the furthest regions of the earth. You can be 2,000, 5,000 years after the Prophet ﷺ, if the earth is still there at that time. And if the, the earth is still there, the Qur'an will still be there and you can open it and see the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. You don't have to have been at that time and that place. Many are the miracles he has been given, but the greatest miracle is the miracle of the Qur'an. As for his blessings, as for his status, as for his prestige and honor, then speak and don't stop speaking. Say and you will not be able to stop. You are going to embark on an ocean which has no shore. You're going to sail on his blessings and you will never be able to finish them. Of these blessings is a beautiful hadith, akhi, if you can hand me volume 5 of a, t five of a tirmidhi. Of these blessings is this beautiful hadith found in Sunan al-Tirmidhi which he, in which he mentioned more than one blessing that he has been given. And remember that the Prophet ﷺ, he is the Khatamun Nabiyin, the final of all Prophets. Therefore Allah chose him above the rest. In hadith number 3615, the Prophet ﷺ said, I am the leader of the children of Adam on the day of judgment. The leader, the one person who will be the leader of the entire mankind, not just Muslims. Not just those that came after the Prophet ﷺ. All the people from the time of Adam until the trumpet is blown, I will be their leader. So he is the best of the creation. And he said after this, Wala faqr. I am not boasting. This is the fact. He said this in the hadith, Wala faqr. I am not boasting. I am not saying something I shouldn't say. This is a fact. He said in my hands will be the banner of praise. All of mankind will be under this banner of praise. And I say this without any arrogance. And every single prophet on that day, from Adam until those after them, will be under my banner. And I will be the first person. I will be the first person who will be resurrected from the grave. And I am not boasting. In other words, I am telling you the fact. The first one to be resurrected from this grave. The Prophet ﷺ, of his blessings was that he was sent to all of mankind of his time and no other prophet was sent to all of mankind. They were all sent to certain peoples and places. Of his blessings was that he was, that he was even sent to the jinn and not just to man. Of his blessings is that he will have the largest ummah, the largest gathering following on the day of judgment. All the other prophets will be less and fewer following or, or people that followed them than him. Of his blessings is that even though he is the last prophet, 
وسلم, on the day of judgment, his reckoning and the reckoning of his nation will be the first as a means of showing honor to him. Of his blessings is that he has been given a large fountain called Hawd on the day of judgment. And the Prophet وسلم, said that whoever drinks from this fountain will never taste any thirst after this. He will never be thirsty after this. And this is of his blessings. And he said this mountain, its cups are the number of stars of the sky. Of his blessings is that he will be the first person to cross over the bridge that is laid over the fire of hell. Of his blessings is that he will be the first person to knock on the gates of Jannah. No one will get to the gates of Jannah before him. Of his blessings is that Jannah will only be open because of him. The, 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 the angel in charge of the gates of paradise of Jannah, he will say, who is there? And the Prophet ﷺ will say, I am Muhammad ﷺ. So the angel will say, you are the one who I have been commanded to open for. Of his blessings that he will be the first amongst mankind to step foot into Jannah. And of his blessings, as narrated in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, hadith number 3612, he said that of his blessings is that he will be given the wasila and the fadila. The wasila is the highest level of paradise. The highest level. Paradise is shaped, if you like, like a pyramid going up. In other words, the higher you go and the greater the blessings, the fewer the people that will get it. The lower you are, the bigger it is, so the more people will be there. The top, the apex of this pyramid, the highest, if you like, where only one person will be given that position, will be our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And this is, we call it al wasila It is a station in paradise which no one else will be given. And his blessings go on and on and on and on. We can talk and talk until we get tired and we will not be able to do justice to our Prophet ﷺ. But what does it mean to say Muhammad Rasulullah? Is it just a verbalization? Like a parrot we say Muhammad Rasulullah? Or are there certain implications? Are there certain factors that are necessitated by this? Indeed there are. And in the remainder of today's lesson and in the next lesson, we will discuss 10 such factors. 10 factors that are necessitated by our testimony of Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The first of these factors and obligations is the obligation to believe in him. You must believe that he is a prophet of Allah and sent by Allah. And this is obvious. This is the whole meaning of Muhammadur Rasulullah. If we don't believe he is Rasulullah, what is the point of saying this testimony? This is the first obligation, the first right. The second right that we have when we say this testimony, the second matter that, this, that is necessitated by this testimony is that we love the Prophet ﷺ. We defend him physically if we're able. And if we're not, then we defend his honor. As Allah says in Surah Al-Fatih, verse 8 and 9, إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمَشِرًا وَنَذِيرًا We have sent you to be a warner and a giver of glad tidings so that you may believe in him and respect him and honor him and defend him. You meaning us. So that we may believe in him. Honor him, respect him, and defend him. This is a primary, fundamental implication. When we say Muhammad Rasulullah, we have to love the Prophet ﷺ, respect him, show him honor, and defend him and his honor. Of the matters which are due when we say Muhammad Rasulullah is to believe that the Prophet ﷺ was the most eager to guide his nation, and therefore he explained the message in clear and unambiguous terms. He gave us every single piece of knowledge that we need. And that when He gave us that knowledge, He gave it to us in the most clearest of terms. As the Quran says in Surah at tawbah verse 24, that verily a prophet has come to you who it distresses him to see you in pain. It distresses him to see you in difficulty. He is eager to guide you. He is eager to guide you and he is ever merciful. He is forgiving for the believers. Yet another factor which is necessitated when we say Muhammad Rasulullah is to believe that he explained the complete religion and did not hide anything from us. That he left us upon the shining light, its night is like, the shining path, its night is like its day. That he gave us every single information, every single matter that we needed, he told it to us. He didn't leave anything out of this religion. As Allah says in the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today I have perfected your religion, completed it. 
if the religion is complete, this means that you don't have to add, you don't have to subtract, you don't have to change, you don't have to substitute. What is the meaning of something which is complete? It means in and of itself it is perfect. Which means that the Prophet ﷺ told us everything that we need to know. There is not a single matter except that he has told us about it. And this is of the fundamental matters that we must believe in. As one of the famous scholars says, said of the past, that whoever believes that there is something remaining in this religion, that there is a good innovation in this religion, that indeed he has accused the Prophet ﷺ of not fulfilling his message. When you claim that there is something else I can add or subtract or change or, or do something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do, you are claiming that he didn't do a good job, A'udhu Billah. He didn't tell us what we need to know. That there are still other factors that we need to add to this religion. So you're accusing him of not fulfilling his role as a Prophet. A'udhu Billah. We seek Allah's refuge from this. These are just four of the points that we must believe in. We need to, we've come to the end of our episode. We'll continue in the next six. In our next episode, please... Join us next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.